this, this is being recorded, right? Yeah. Um, so after it's all over, when you've got the video prepared, I hope I can post a link to it on the Seraphile website. Cool. Sure. Okay. And uh, yeah, I don't have any slides or anything prepared, but if I do that, post it via the link to the website, I'll just include a link to all the essays that I re reference. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll get going. So yeah, I, I look back through all the essays I've written on the subject of measurements since I joined Stereophile. And I, I struck by one I, I called subjective fact or objective fantasy, which I think sums up the dichotomy between the two fields. And then I, I found some quotes from Hilary Lawson of the BBC in 1985. She said, science is there to be used, not to dictate what is true. Um, Michael Fremer interviewed the late Siegfried Linklitz before he died. And Siegfried said, the ears are for listening, the eyes are for looking. Do not confuse with what you see, what you hear with what you see. And the other thing is, you know, you can't, you, what was I going to say? Yeah. And the whole point of measurements is Gordon Holt founded Stereophile and the idea that the best way you can judge a product is to listen to it, to use it as its designer intended. Um, George Bernard Shaw said 100 years ago, you don't have to be a carpenter to judge the quality of a table. You just have to sit at the table and you will know. So why do measurements? Well, I'll give you some background. When I joined Hi-Fi News in 1986 as an editorial assistant, my job was to compile the news and both for music and for audio and to do, I did interviews with musicians to be published in the magazine. So although I was an audiophile, I didn't have any responsibility for the measurements or reviewing side of the magazine back then. But as I got into the job and I met in particular Martin Collins, Martin involved me in his listening tests, which were then done for Hi-Fi Choice. So once a month, I get, get involved in blind listening tests, both single and double. And also talking to Martin about measurements, I realized that I needed to know more about measurements. And I mean, I, I had scientific education. I was a DIY person. I built mic preamps, mic mixers, even a tube amplifier at one point, tried my hand at making loudspeakers, failed utterly at it. And so I, I got talking to him about it and to Noel Keywood, who's now the editor of Hi-Fi World. And in the end, got some hands-on experience. I used to rent the anechoic chamber that Acoustic Research had in, in um, Dunstable, a little town near London. And Martin and I used to measure speakers there. Um, 1981, got myself a BBC Micro, my first PC, real PC. That had an analog input, an A to D converter. So I started building my own test equipment in order to feed it to the BBC computer and wrote basic apps, which would take the input from the little the test gear I made and draw graphs and do calculations. Anyway, so Hi-Fi News, as you probably know, always used to accompany its reviews with measurements dating way back to the 60s. And the two went together, the subjective experience and the measurements. So it was totally familiar to me that that's how magazines should be. So when I came to the United States to edit Stereophile, Stereoph Gordon Holt, the magazine's founder, had published me occasional measurements, but it was the magazine was about listening, about judging products by how they perform in their intended use. So sat thinking for three years. First three years I was at Stereophile, there were so many things to organize, you know, as well as relocating across the Atlantic. But in 1989, decided to create a measurement section for our reviews. We bought an audio precision system one, we bought a DRA Labs Melissa system, <clears throat> um, bought an audio control, third, third octave analyzer, and I bought first of many microphones, measurement microphones. And in the, order, in the fall of 89, we started doing measurements. And I wrote about that time, why were we doing this in a subjective review magazine? Well, the first was the measurements would show up 
compatibility problems. Loudspeaker with a low impedance or a really high phase angle would cause amplifiers conniptions to being driven at any high level unless the amplifier was had a heroic output stage. Second was, were there any obvious measurement, measured reasons why the product should sound the way it does? And I, I, the example always comes to mind is of a phono preamp back then, which was getting great reviews for its, you know, airy high, high frequencies, its detail, its sparkle. Well, the RIAA curve was horribly wrong. It just rose above five kilohertz. So the top two octaves were basically, it was a tone control. It was adding too much treble, which people who were just listening to it were initially liking because, wow, so much treble, so much high frequency energy. And to me, the measurements show that a product like that is really just an expensive tone control. In other words, you don't want to spend a lot of money on something which is deliberately wrong. Um, the third reason was basically to, and I must remember, I'm, I'm talking personally here, these are my opinions, I'm no longer the editor of Stereophile, but I'm, my philosophy, my policy was the measurements would show if the designer was a true master of the craft or somebody who had made a mistake deliberately or inadvertently. It, the idea was that the measurements would, would sort out those products which were truly deserving of praise from those which happened to work but were not optimized. And the fourth goal, and this is something that still remains a goal, not realized, was to build up a database of measured performance but would enable you to predict how a product would sound from what it, how it measured. As I said, that goal still is elusive, as elusive as ever, though I have some ideas on that. So that, that was the fundamental, the four reasons of why we started measurements in Stereophile. And basically continued down those tracks ever since. Um, the, um, the interesting thing is finding, coming across products which have problems, which I'm familiar with from my own experience. As I said, I designed loudspeakers or a loudspeaker, which was awful. And then I tried, I'll tell you a story. 1981, I think it was, or 82, Hi-Fi News reviewed the Celestian SL6, first loudspeaker I'd come across with a metal dome tweeter. And it got a very good review. And in fact, I bought a pair, I still have them, they're in our bedroom system. And I thought, well, if it sounds this good as a conventional passive design, why not make it active? So I removed the crossovers, put a second pair of terminals on the rear and designed and built an electronic, a line crossover, a line, a line level crossover, which duplicated what I'd understood to be the specifications of Celestian's passive crossover. So build, build the crossover, set up the active speakers and sat back to a horrible sound. It was, it was, it, it really, the, the mid range was so emphasized, the bass seemed to have dropped in by level. And I thought, well, what the heck has gone wrong? I, the crossover has exactly the same transfer function for both woofer and tweeter. And it's now line level. So there's none of those sort of awkward interactions you get with passive components. So I called Graham Bank, the speaker's designer and told him what I'd done and what I'd experienced. And he laughed and said, yes, that's exactly what you would get because with a small speaker and a narrow baffle like that, but what you're doing is there's no baffle step compensation. There's no compensation for the fact that the radiation pattern in the bass is omnidirectional because the wavelengths of the sounds are so much larger than the baffle to when it's, you know, wavelengths becomes of, of the order of the baffle. Now all that same energy, instead of being spread out in the room is now focused forward. So you get a rising response through the mid range, which is exactly what I got. So I said, well, you know, what did you do? And he said, ah, we did, we did baffle step compensation in the passive crossover by using an inductor which had quite a high series resistance. So that would give you the tailoring of the mid-range response exactly to compensate for the baffle step problem. 
I thought, ah, okay, I've learned something there. And um, anyway, time passes, years pass, and I'm measuring a speaker that's being reviewed in Stereophile, and I get exactly the same measured response that I had got from my 1982 modified Celestians. And I'm thinking, surely the designer didn't know he had to compensate for baffle step problem. And I, I assume he didn't. And, you know, I come across problems like similar to that relatively often. Um, I mean, look, if you take amplifiers, as I said, I, I built mic preamps, microphone mixers, build a tube amp. I remember once building a solid state integrated amplifier and very proud of it, I was, except it hummed. And I thought, well, why is it humming? So looked around and realized I had the ground references in the amplifier were not all at ground. I mean, ideally you want a star ground where everything is referenced to the same point so that every ground reference is the same for all parts of the circuit. In the amplifier I built, that wasn't true. So I was getting hum. Okay, learned and learned and have a lesson that even if a circuit looks good on paper, when you lay out the circuit board and you arrange for grounding, it can hum. Okay, relatively often now, or over the years and still, I find with amplifiers I test, they hum. And if they hum at 60 hertz, 180 hertz, well, this is probably not something you can do anything about because this is due to the radiated hum field from the power transformer. And you can shield it, but big power transformers put out a lot of 60 hertz. You know, so and if it's you know, below minus 90, well, it's there, but it's nothing to worry about. But then I find that some amplifiers and some DACs and some preamps have hum at 120 hertz, 240 hertz. What this is, is what I experienced with the amplifier I built all those years ago. For all the ground references are not at true ground potential. Um, so I'm thinking, well, why didn't the designer notice that? You know. Did, did, or did he think it was too low in level, Pro possibly? Or did he just not do those final sort of analysis, which is the circuit looks good, the printed circuit boards look good, but I, he hadn't star grounded it. And I, I think there's an amplifier I measured of, God, some years back, had a digital input. So you got a bought-in module, SPDIF input, then it goes to a preamp module going to a power amp stage. And instead of, there was a main chassis ground connection at the speaker terminals. That's okay, that's good. That means that's a, a good ground. But everything upstream from the power amp was floating at higher ground potential because there was no individual grounds connecting them to the chassis, to the where the power amp was grounded. So you got the SP diff input, module is floating several volts above the true ground. The preamp module is floating several volts, a few fewer volts, but still above ground. So the thing hums. And I'm thinking, again, why didn't the designer notice that? Or, or did he design it and then the factory that made it didn't you know, change something and no one actually did any quality assurance at that point? So. So I'm with the measurements, they don't tell you how things sound, but, or to a large extent, individually, they don't tell you how things sound. But what they do do is inform the reader, the would-be customer, is the mind behind that product really a master of the craft or not? And I mean, if you look at some of the, if you look at, um, at I, I, I didn't mean to mention names, but I looked at a benchmark D2A converter some years ago, and it was totally, utterly quiet. And then I took the top off, expecting that with, you know, that with, with a circuit exposed, things would get worse. And it didn't. It picked up no RF. That printed circuit board and the internal grounding of that product was extraordinary, extraordinarily well achieved. Doesn't mean it's the best sounding DAC I've ever heard, but it showed that 
that company knows what they're doing regarding those kind of essentials. Um, yeah. Um, okay, the bigger subject, correlation between what is measured and what is heard. The problem with measurements is you're taking a multi-dimensional behavior of a product and you're choosing two things to plot against each other in a two-dimensional graph or three things in a three-dimensional graph like the waterfall plots I publish. But the behavior of a product is multi-dimensional. It varies also with time. Um, so by choosing immediately you decide to make a measurement you're restricting the real world behavior of that product to what you can measure in, in, in a two, two or three dimensional graph. So you cannot look at any one measurement um, to decide how something sounds. A loudspeaker may have a flat response, for example. So you think, ah, oh, it's neutral. And you listen to it and it sounds unbelievably polite. Okay, so if it's not in a frequent response, what is causing that? Okay, you look at the radiation pattern in the horizontal plane and you find that there's a huge suck out to the sides because the designer has taken a two-way design, used a woofer, which is maybe say a 10 inch in diameter, crossing over at two kilohertz to a one inch diameter tweeter. So 10 inch woofer above 800 hertz or so is gonna get very directional, no energy to the sides. Tweeter comes in at two kilohertz, huge amount of energy to the sides. So what the net result is the, the direct sound is flat. The in-room sound, the reverberant field has a serious lack of energy in the crossover, just over crossover region. So now you have to look at frequent response and dispersion. Okay, you make a speaker which has flat response on axis and well-controlled even dispersion. The parameters that um, Floyd Toole at Harman has, has decided or his experiments have shown people prefer. Except the speaker sounds hard. You, you, oh, you know, I, I can play it quietly, but if I turn it up, I want to turn it down again. So, all right, maybe it's, you know, there's high levels of distortion. That could be a problem. It's not something I routinely measure because to do distortion rigorously, you need an anechoic chamber. And we don't have one. Or it could be something else. The, um, I remember we reviewed a, an Avalon speaker back in the early 90s flat response, well-controlled dispersion, superbly accurate stereo imaging, but it sounded hard. And what happened was that the late Charlie Hansen who designed it had decided that he crossed over this one inch tweeter at one kilohertz, an octave or an, or an octave and a half below what would be normal. He got fantastic stereo, accurate, you know, except you take that one inch tweeter and you drive it down to one kilohertz, the thing is now really running out of headroom and excursion uh, in a region where there's a lot of musical energy. So well worth measuring speaker, but a fatal flaw. Um, the digital measurements, um, back in the old days, the late eighties, early nineties, digital converters had horrible linearity problems at low levels. The ladder, ladder resistor jack, jack chips that were used really had problems at, at dealing with very low level signals. And so we used to measure linearity error and used to look at things like you put in a one kilohertz tone at minus 90 dB FS and what would come out would be a two kilohertz tone because minus one LSB would give you a level which was actually the same as plus one LSB. So you don't, they acted as frequency doublers at low levels. Um, ad, advent of Sigma Delta DAX, sorry about the phone. Advent, abs, advent of Sigma Delta DAX got rid of the linearity error, but introduced other problems. In particular, they are much more prone to jitter. Um, years passed, these all become solved problems, but DAX still have some issues. One you find is with, well, it's a recent pair of DACs I measured did something very odd. I looked at the linearity error and found that as you stepped down, every time you stepped down, the level went up a little bit or down a little bit, and then up a bit and down a little bit. This is very strange. It's a, a resistor ladder DAC, uh, but 
very high quality. And what looked like what was happening was that the LSB was being flipped with every change in signal level. So, you know, whoever wrote the firmware to control the FBGA for that resistor ladder DAC, switching all the resistors, had made some kind of error and no one had caught it. And no one had, had actually measured this DAC until Stereophile did. So you find these odd things happening with DACs still. So, so that's basically the presentation I wanted to give, but you know, the, the measurements don't tell you how, any one measurement does not tell you how something sounds. But if you look at all the measurements together, you can get an idea of the product's sonic character. It still won't tell you if it's good or great. That is where the listening comes in. Anyway, so that, that, that's really what I wanted to say. So questions. Can you think of an example of uh, a product that sounded um, dramatically different than it measured, either for the better or for the worse? You don't have to. You don't have to name it. Just if you don't want to, just curious of if if well, you've I, found examples of that. There are many pro products where they measure terribly. They have really poor behavior in some areas, and yet. The reviewer liked them a lot. So now I'm thinking, well, why is that? What is, what is being heard that I'm not measuring? Or what is the product doing right that outweighs what it's doing wrong? And um, I'll name a name here. The, the DeVore Fidelity Orang 096, Orangutan 096. Big white baffle, 10-inch woofer, 1-inch tweeter. It had a lot of measured issues, yet I when I set them up in my room, it, it sounded pretty good. And I think what happens in circumstances like that is if you look at any one measurement, which is not good, the overall performance of the loudspeaker shows that the designer has actually balanced things against one another. But with the 10 inch woofer, you get low distortion. The wide baffle gets rid of it or does something about that dispersion problem. Um, He's, the on-axis response isn't flat, but it's balancing the radiation pattern very nicely. So the designer is balancing issues, measured issues, to get something which sounds better than you would expect from any one measurement. Um, trying to think of another example. I always have problems with horn-loaded speakers. In fact, I just prepared a review by Gordon Holt to go up on the Stereophile website next week, where he, he lists two speakers of 90, that he'd found to be the best sounding in 1966, the Altec A7 and the Electra Voice, um, what the heck was it? Not the Century, that was the pro version. Anyway, one of the, one of the Electra Voice speakers. And he felt these were two of the best sounding speakers he'd experienced by then, but they're horns and horns have awful measured problems in that there's no time synchronization between the individual drive units. The, the woofer always follows, you know, way behind the tweeter. If you have a two-way or a three-way horn, you have all the problems with at the low end of each horn, it, on the high end, you get reflections, you get all these things where they don't integrate properly. You know, I mean, if you want to do a good horn speaker, you make it like a five or six way and use DSP to time align all the outputs. But that is an unbelievably expensive solution. And yet Gordon loved, as I said, Gordon loved the sound of horns. He always did. He, he told me when I joined Stereophile that they had a jump factor that he just found so seductive. And I'm thinking, what the heck is a jump factor? It's not something that shows up in my measurements, in, in standard measurements. Art Dudley, the late Art Dudley, loved the sound of his horns, his Altec Flamencos, his Altec Valencias. Um, he did a Ray review of the, of the, of the Klitsch horn AK6 two years ago, 18 months ago, which he loved and I found had measured issues, particularly with re resonances and reflections. Um, lack of integration between the units but he said it had it had it endowed music with the right amount of force of drive and again i'm thinking that's what gordon used to call jump factor and 
that is something that I'm not sure how to measure, unless it's the fact with a horn. The late, oh, one of the writers for, for, for Hi-Fi News, um, oh, I've forgotten his name. Anyway, he used to say, if you had a perfect speaker that had 100% efficiency at turning electrical power into acoustic power, it would have no distortion and it would have no coloration. And I'm wondering if the thing about horns is that they just have, there's no moving parts in, in a sense at normal listening levels. So distortion is unbelievably low, harmonic distortion, intermodulation distortion. And that's what people are thinking of as the jump factor, the force, the drive. John, there was a lot of classic records made with those horn monitors back yeah, in the day. I'm with I, you. I don't like how they sound, but boy, there was a lot of really good records made with, with those know, in the, the studio. The studio I worked in in, in the um, mid-70s had a pair of those Altec monitors. Do you remember they have a gray cabinet with a black grill over the drive? Yeah, the 604s. I hated the sound of those. In fact, oh, I heard a pair. at you. Yeah, I heard a pair just recently at, um, at uh, well, before they closed at System 2 Studio in Brooklyn. And Mike Marciano said, oh, you've got to listen to these because he normally listens on a little pair of Power Genelex, neutral, ever, you know, measure really well. And he set up the 604s and I went, oh, I know that sound. I hate it. <laughs> but Gordon loved it. And her, Art Dudley and Herb Reichert loved the sound of the 604 drive unit. John, here's a question that has uh, concerned me. At 78 years of age, I am not able to rely on my ears anymore because I'm having a hard time hearing 10 kilohertz. So I wind up using uh, a couple of spectrum analyzers to give me an idea of what the overall spectrum is doing mm. on material that I'm working on. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you and I are close to the same age. I, and, I, I'll soon be 73. You're, you're 73. Well, okay, I, I, got, uh, I got five years on you. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm just wondering, do you find that your ear response is falling off to the point where you start second guessing yourself? Well, my, my cutoff right now is about 13.5 kilohertz at normal listening levels. I, I, every time I measure a loudspeaker, I just, for interest sake, see where I stop hearing it. Um, uh, what? I mean, Gordon Holt, when I, when I joined the magazine, he, his hearing high frequency cutoff had dropped to about 11 kilohertz and continued to drop all the time I worked with him until he left the magazine in 2009. However, I took part in a lot of listening sessions with Gordon. And even though I could hear, you know, half an octave back then more than he could in the, the top end, his opinions on sound quality, I always found completely reliable. And I think I think it's as long as you don't have hearing damage at lower frequencies. I mean, classically, if if you if you fire guns, you will destroy your hearing in the in the in the upper mid range low treble. You'll get a sensitivity notch that's an octave deep, an octave wide. But if you but if you have good hearing lower in frequency, yes, as your high frequency cutoff slowly rolls off with age, yeah, you'll miss. A resonant problem at 19 kilohertz, but you'll still get your hearing will still be reliable for pretty much the entire musical spectrum. You're just going to miss those upper, upper, very those upper overtones. It's hell when you're trying to uh, uh, line up azimuth on a tape machine. Ah, well, <laughs> I, I just got rid of my Ampex, so I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> Uh, I still have a couple of them, so anyway. Oh, uh, one um, point that I was going to make. Uh, the comment on the um, microphone earlier, if you can see this. Yeah. Um, that's an RCA BK1A. I went and dug out my old uh, 
fifth edition broadcast audio equipment catalog, and there it was. Anyway, um, carry on. Okay. Um, I, I have a question, John. You mentioned yeah. the, um, the uh, tool research and Harman curve and that kind of thing. And I'm curious, given the amount of equipment that you've heard, what you feel a, a role, like what role should a standard like that have in speaker development. So should speaker designers be kind of starting with that as a target and then work on the other stuff, as you say, the, the jump, the baffle steps, the other things to get to do, to do what they want to do? Or is it, is it just a choice? Um, I even, um, I picked up a pair of these AKG 371s recently, which are supposed to match this Harman's headphone curve. Right. Now. They're outstanding. My my experience, 110 bucks. So, like, but what what do you think that type of information should be used for as as a speaker designer? Um, it, there's a short answer, which is speaking personally. I feel that speaker designers should use the um, tool findings as their initial target, because you know, Tool and, and Sean Olive did all these listening tests at Harmon in California, where they basically listened to loudspeakers in mono. Loudspeakers were moved around into the same place in the listening room for the blind tests. And their findings were consistent. But if you produce a speaker with a flat on axis response and a well-controlled, even dispersion radiation pattern, people will, under blind conditions, will prefer that. Okay, so I think that should be the starting point for a loudspeaker designer. The much longer answer is, but what if that produces a design that doesn't sell? Even though people prefer, people under blind conditions will prefer it, but when they audition it, they don't buy it. And I think that's a real problem because in a dealer, you want to, you know, a dealer showroom, the speaker needs to impress. It needs to have sparking highs and big bass. That is not really neutral, doesn't follow tools findings. The end, then you have a problem where there are several companies that have massive resources available to them. Anechoic chambers, you know, best software, really talented engineers designing and they produce speakers which are nothing like tools, tools, goals, is recommendations. And when we review those, I'm wondering what it is that the why they've decided to produce something which is, you know, wrong. in what you might call is just wrong. And <laughs> it could be that it could be that they want something which has a house sound that can be identified as their design, even if you don't, you know, walk into a room and you go, oh yes, that's that brand, or well, that's that brand. Whereas if it was flat, neutral, well-controlled radiation pattern, low distortion, it actually won't stand out from the crowd. Um, so it's, it's a puzzle to me, why designers choose not to start with something adhering to the tools findings. Um, thank you for mentioning like, the market thing because I've never thought of that. It, it's it, it you know because I've never really been I haven't been in a showroom in a long time. Aud, you know auditioning speakers because you know there's so much information available yeah. elsewhere. But it's fascinating to think that a well-designed speaker may not test well in, in a in a in a dealer's marketplace. So thank you. Yeah, I mean if you think about it. If you look at class A in recommended components, stereophiles recommended components. These are all fantastic speakers, and they all sound different from one another. Uh, well, that's, <laughs> I had a comment. Um, if you consider dipole speakers, their goal is kind of not to have side firing energy. Right. So they go completely against the Harman. The Harman is. Uh, if you're doing direct radiator, forward firing, mm. that makes sense. And if you're in a highly reflective room, um, and most small rooms are bad for acoustics. So you take a dipole and you kind of take the room out by having a dipole radiation pattern. 
And it's similar with the large, uh, the wide band, the 10 inch, 12 inch wide yeah. bands, they're firing right at you and you take the room out. So then maybe the Harmon rule goes out the window. Maybe you may have a point. There's also the fact that how big panel speakers do, they have a property which I cannot measure. And that is that their intensity, sound power per unit radiating error is very different from a moving coil drive unit. And for example, I mean, we, you know, we talked earlier about the KEF LS50 and the LS50 Meta, which I love the LS50. They're my go-to reference in my room. They actually are pretty much all the speaker you would need given the limitations on loudness and the fact that they don't go very deep. But think about those speakers reproducing a piano. The radiating surface of a piano is very large. You listen to a piano recording on the KEFs, tonally it's accurate, sound staging on the recording is superb, well-defined in space, but it's a tiny piano. Whereas if you listen to a recording of a piano on magna planers or, or quad ESL 60, uh, what would they be, 989s, the piano sounds right in terms of if the feeling that the piano is the right size. And I, so and that's down to the intensity being wrong on typical moving coil speakers. But, but intensity is correct for voices. The width of the KEF LS50 is the same width as a human head. So you listen to a recording of somebody singing and it's very lifelike, but it's wrong on pianos and it's, and it's wrong on the orchestras. It's wrong on anything that's big. And it's gotta be because I conjecture it's because the intensity is wrong. As I said, the intensity that the SPL per, per unit area, radiating area. Um, setting up dipoles in rooms is tricky because you're, yes, you're not getting side reflections, but you are getting that delayed reflection from a wall behind the loudspeaker. And that can give you problems if you're not careful. So, I mean, what was it? The rule of thirds, you set your dipoles a third away into the room. That will give you the best optimization between front and rear radiation. But I haven't actually listened to a pair of dipoles in my room for, oh, maybe 20 years. Speaking of your room, would you be willing to give us a little tour of it? Sure. I mean, once people, if I've once I'd answered everybody's questions. Yeah. I, uh, any I was, more questions? I have another question. I have one too. <laughs> um, uh, you mentioned horns. What about the newer waveguides? Uh, Gettys is uh, Suma speaker and the, the JBLs that are mostly using waveguides. Well, the waveguide is, is giving you, it's not so much increasing the sensitivity, which is the old one idea of using a horn, but what it's doing is, is tailoring the radiation pattern of each unit to be crossed over optimally to the one above and the one below it. And, and I mean, that, that's always a good idea. John, I have a question. Yes, Tom. Um, <clears throat> so I, it's kind of a rapid fire thing. I want to, I want to name a couple of statistics that or a couple of measurements that you do. And if you would comment your opinion on on what a person would listen to listen for if they were auditioning that sort of equipment and how it would relate to that measurement okay you up for that yeah um so the first thing would be with power amps um i like looking at your square wave response um and i know what i like with a square wave response but but tell tell people what what it what it means when a measurement's not when it's out of square and and what that what that may um mean and how they hear the power amp well um if if a top slope it means it has limited low frequency response if there's overshoot and ringing it means the amplifier is going to be is, is is inherently unstable and so every transient is going to be accompanied by some of that um most likely that instability is going to be at an ultrasonic frequency. And so I'm not sure if it directly affects sound quality. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's, it's diagnostic, but it doesn't actually tell you about sound quality. Unlike loudspeakers where none of them produce, well, I was going to say none produce square waves, quads, Dunleavies, Teals, Vandersteens. Okay, that's it. <laughs> They're the ones who can do square waves. 
Now, what about the the different filter slopes that that you show with your with the digital with the DAX? Um, can you tell what 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 would you listen for with pre ringing versus post ringing with a with a steep filter versus a okay. gradual filter? This is an an awkward subject because yes, as I've shown in 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 my review in my measurements and also in some articles I've written for the magazine, you get with a linear phase filter you get pre ringing and post ringing, um, but it's a Nyquist, it's at 22.05 kilohertz with a with CD, it's at 48 kilohertz with 96K program. So why does it matter? Um, I discussed this with um, Karl Heinz Brandenburg, one of the developers of MP3, and he said, well, what happens is that your ear detects the envelope of the sound. So when the ringing starts, the pre-ringing starts, your, your, ear, your brain detects that something is happening doesn't identify it as a frequency, just aware there's an event starting. Then when you get the peak, your ear and brain go, ah, transient. So with a linear phase filter, you're getting two events every, in, every time instead of one, even if you can't actually hear the frequency. So, okay, so use a minimum phase filter, um, which has all the ringing after the event. Um, that would seem a good idea. So do you, but do you make that filter short or long? Does it ring for a long time? Does it ring for a short time? If it rings for a short time, you get a slow roll off. Um, the late Charlie Hansen of Air Acoustics would say, make it slow. Um, if you look at the um, Grimm server I reviewed in the March issue, Elko Grimm says, make it as long as possible. Same with um, Rob Watts at Cord. And the interesting thing is that in my own listening, I actually like those unbelievably long filters, or I also like the very short, slow roller filters. What I don't like are the ones that are in between, moderately long and moderately short. But I, but I think I, I, I show those results anyway, particularly now with you know the, um, the, the ESS Sabre DAC inherently has seven different filters built into it. And some manufacturers offer all of them. Some, like Exasound, choose one. But I, I'll show them all anyway. And the final, <clears throat> the final measurement I'm interested in is um, this. This is this is a controversial thing going back as far as I've been reading audio magazines. What what level of of harmonic distortion really matters? Like, is that statistic even meaningless? Is, is anymore because everything is so low in the solid state uh, right now? Well. I, I think it's on Stereophile's test CD3. I created uh, some test tracks where you could listen for yourself to find out at what level of second, third, and seventh harmonic distortion you can hear just by going pure plus distortion, pure plus distortion, dropping the level of the distortion each time. Second and third, second is very hard to hear on pure tones, even harder to hear on music. You can, I can just hear 1% of second on a pure tone. Music, it's probably going to be 3%. Third, I can hear a little bit more. Seventh, seventh, fifth, seventh, ninth are horribly audible, even if they're down to 0.03%. So that's why I publish the harmonic signature of everything, of every amplifier we review. Because if it's all second, then big corollary here, the second doesn't, isn't accompanied by a huge amount of intermodulation distortion. And it doesn't change its character as the level goes up. In other words, if it's low power, it's primarily second. If it changes to fifth at high power, well, that's an amplifier that's gonna sound hard and unpleasant when you turn it up. But if it's second, primarily second, and the character doesn't, that sonic character, harmonic signature doesn't change with frequency or level, and it's below 1%, then probably people are gonna like the sound of that amplifier. Um, if it's fifth or seventh, no one's going to like the sound of that amplifier. All right. Thanks, John. I'll let, I'll let others. Thank you very much. I have a question, if I may, uh, and a comment. First, I love to see all the measured performances in, in reviews, because when it comes to measurements, I know exactly what it means. I'm an engineer by trade, so they mean something to me. Uh, and to expand on that, you talked about the benchmark device that measured wonderfully, but you said it wasn't necessarily the best device at doing it. And so the question is, 
best at what metric? You already I, measured well, it and it was better. So, so please let me finish. And so yeah. the question is, how do we evaluate the evaluators? Because when I see a measured performance, I know what it means, but when somebody, I, you or another reviewer says, I like this, that doesn't necessarily mean much to me. And uh, how much acuity do they have? That's one thing. And acuity comes with training. So obviously having a lot of experience is very useful. Still, I would love you to measure people the review. How well do they recognize differences? Some are going to be better than others. And if somebody says, I compare this speaker to that speaker, and it happened over the course of two days, human memory of sounds is pathetic long term. Yeah. they be using ABX and so on. So if you can expand on that topic, I would really appreciate it. Well, I, I wrote a, an article in the magazine, gosh, two years ago, called Who Watches the Watchers? And it addresses that very subject with the, with, the, with the magazine's review team. I used to visit people as often as I could, you know, relatively often for the New York based writers, once every two or three years with those in California or in Washington state. Um, and I just sit and listen with them. And we listen to music, we have a good time. And actually what I'm doing is testing them. Do I hit, you know, tell me what you hear. Do I hear what you tell me you're hearing? And with Stereophile's team of writers, I, I was confident that they are very good at describing what they hear. And um, for example, something, a point I've made in print several times, the writers never see the measurements before they've written a review and submitted it to the editor, because I would never want them to describe what they think they were hearing I want them to describe what they were actually hearing. And that was that to me was a very important point. Writers never see the measurements because you know it's their experience that is worth publishing, not what they think they should be experiencing. Um, so that's a very a, the, that's the other thing is 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 hearing, hearing sensitivity, hearing tests. Um, Cal Rubinson and I have both published our hearing sensitivity curves in the magazine. And what happens is that you then get dismissed. Oh, John Atkinson can't hear of 13.5 kilohertz. Therefore, I prefer this reviewer for this other magazine who I, who I assume has much better hearing. So you, by actually being honest about how, you're, how good you hear, how good your hearing sensitivity is, you're creating a rod for other people to hit you. With so uh, that's um, not the kind of measurement I was thinking of, right? But and, and, I, I, and, when and everybody it does it, that would be fine. But until then, as I said, I create a rod for people to hit me with by 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 saying I can't hear above thirteen point five kilohertz right now. No, I say something in defense of the reviewers or from a reviewer's point of view. Um, by having this protocol in which we do not get to see the measurements until we've actually submitted our uh, opinions, we actually get a check from John on what we are hearing and if we are hearing the right things. If there are things he points out that we missed, that should be obvious to the reader. And if there are things that we get, which are subtle, that he can confirm, that is also some information for the reader. I'm just saying that the, that the system works both ways. Yeah. Yeah, and of course- uh, I, was, I was really looking for a more objective measure of sound rather than a personal preference. And I do agree that a lot of the descriptive features that you described about a sound are useful. They're just that much further removed from what I find useful that I, I'm looking for some mechanism to make it more translatable to useful information. And I don't okay. know what the right answer is. I, I'm looking there's, for- there's, there's lots of outlets that offer more measurement oriented reviews and analysis. So I, I suggest you look towards those. If I could just make seeking. one comment, John. Um, back in oh. the old days before COVID, um, I used to be on uh, Marshall Knack's reviewing panel and he was a, he was a reviewer. He reviewed various ex expensive equipment, but he always had other guys come in and he wouldn't tell us what he thought of the equipment. He would say, okay, you guys, uh, what do you hear? Uh, you other two guys who are listening to these same records, describe the sound to me. 
and I will tell you what I think until you tell me what you think. And you know, he would he would like put one component in and we'd play the record and he'd take the and then he'd put another component in and we'd play the same record and he'd say, okay, you guys, what do you hear? And he wrote down what we heard, what we described to him, but he wouldn't give us his opinion until we were finished. So he, as a reviewer, he kind of had a way of like checking, what, am I crazy? Am I just, you know, completely off base or does this equipment really do this and sound like this? And this way he got a lot better reviews, even though sometimes, you know, he had to print our dis dissent in his review say, well, the other guys on my listening panel heard this instead of what I heard. So take this for what it's worth. Okay. And I, I just to go back to the previous person, Go back to my quote from Hillary Lawson, science is there to be used, not to dictate what is true. What is true is what people experience and are honest about describing. The science is there to find out why. John, I think that goes back to your thing that there is no absolute sound, right? <laughs> the, 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 it's, it, there's not, there's aesthetics, but everybody hears things differently and everybody has their preferred aesthetic, right? Yes, and that's why, right from when I, when I became the editor of Hi-Fi News in 82, I, I said, well, you have to describe what, rec to said to the reviewers, you have to describe what recordings you use. Because if, say, you, you always use recordings made with space omni mics, then you can never make a value judgment on a speaker's stereo imaging, because on that recording, there is no stereo imaging. Um, you use free space mics, like, your father did okay now you now you have a clue or you use bloom line miking you get a very good idea but if you just use one kind of recording you know you only ever play female voice you never play organ how can you describe what happens in the bass um you, you know so so the reviewer is obliged to use as many different kinds of music as possible as many different kinds of recording as possible and to be honest about what he hears he or she hears that's 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 what they do, and as I said, I think Stereophiles team are the best I've ever worked with at doing that. John, this may be a uh, dumb question, but in the case of where you're running a blind test, let's say where you want to test preamps, for example, and uh, you've got five different uh, pieces of preamp that you want to test. Well, it seems to me that you would have to make very, very precise settings of the levels of those five preamps before you started switching back and forth for people to listen to them. Because oh. even a dB difference in level will sound different and you'll get a different report. Of course, but I mean, matching levels is basically <laughs> to a trade craft. I was going to say on blind tests, having done so many of them, <coughs> done right, they are incredibly time consuming. Um, when we used to do blind tests for speakers in for stereophile in, in the early 90s, we started off with six or seven people in the listening room and we had speakers behind a curtain. OK, the curtain change the acoustics to the point that the speakers no sound no longer sounded like they would in real life. Okay, so Tom Norton came up with the idea, he got some very acoustically transparent grill cloth and made a cylinder of grill cloth around each speaker. That got rid of that problem, except now, looking at the results statistically, only the people in the center line were producing repeat repeatable valid data, okay? no longer six or seven people in the room, we do three and do three times as many tests. Okay, now looking at those results statistically and now doing statistical analysis on the results, really there's only one person in the room who is really producing reliable data. Okay, so instead of having six, seven or nine people all at once, we now have nine tests each with one person in the room and it becomes incredibly time consuming when done right. And then at the end of those tests, you know, the reviewers would take home the speakers with them. And really the blind listing tests didn't generate that much different data from what people 
generated listening under sighted conditions on their own. So that, that matches what uh, I saw, we saw um, when we did blind listening tests here in the group. Um, we compared about a dozen speakers back to back blind listening. And uh, I'd say about half, when I looked at the results from the members that we did statistical analysis, about half the members, there were consistent results uh, maybe as many as two third, close to, as to two thirds, or let's say sixty percent, mm -hmm. were more consistent. And then there was that forty percent that their their reaction to the speakers was not predictable or consistent. It was interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. I did I did a lot of blind tests in the UK in the eighties. I remember one test we did on capacitors, listening to same circuit but with a very high value polypropylene capacitor the other with an unbiased electrolytic of the same value and that kind of blind listening test can be useful because you're comparing just one variable there's nothing different in the room and we found in those tests that people could actually detect the sound that they preferred or rather they identified when it was capacitor a versus capacitor b and that's, for example, that's what Jeff Martin does at Bang & Olufsen. They use blind testing extensively there, but not to, not to identify products, but to identify components. Should we use this premium capacitor at this point in the circuit or a generic one? And blind tests, they, they, you said they do a blind test, last 45 minutes, they bring in their listeners, 45 minutes later, they go away repeat the next morning, repeat the morning after that. And at the end of a week, you've built up a lot of data saying you should use the expensive capacitor or the, or the gen cheap generic. But that's where blind test works well, but it doesn't work so well as on complete products. And with loudspeakers, unless you have a, a physical speaker shuffling facility like Harman does, it's really difficult. And even with Harman, they remove it one step from reality because they listen in mono. No one listens in mono, we listen in stereo. And you can't necessarily infer the behavior of the stereo speakers in stereo from their mono behavior. You can have some guesses, but you still might miss something. That's what precipitated our group. Uh, and it was my idea doing uh, a listening, a speaker listening uh, session um, with uh, six, seven, eight pairs of speakers um, that we did mono. We can, we first, we listened to the speakers and mono and the same tracks of music level matched and then we listen to the same speakers in in stereo well, to, they see, the same to see if the ranking was different and um this the ranking was different um some speakers the speakers that ranked mono highly in mono didn't necessarily rank highly in stereo listening and uh, did, were they all in the same places in the room? Uh, well, yes. When for yeah. stereo, yeah, for the for both. When for mono, yeah. we had a stand in the middle. They were all satellite speakers, bookshelves. Uh, they were all put on the same stand at the exact same position. And for the stereo listening, same thing. They were put on the same stands. Yeah. Chris, um, a question about that. Um, Presumably, uh, the individual speakers that you were using would have different efficiencies. How or we level matched uh, we, be, before we played the, the same music tracks on each speaker. We did a level matching. Okay. We played a tone I, I that was, was on our thinking, test disc. I was kind of thinking that what you may have done would be to drive the speakers from an amplifier where you could precisely set the the SPL outputs. Uh, we did. We did. We we used the sound level meter before we listened to each speaker and made sure they were all at the same level. Yeah. Okay. I have a question for John. We've uh, we've kind of hinted at the fact that there's a bit of rivalry between stereophile and the absolute sound. <laughs> um, so um, there's a, a relatively, at least to, to me, new website called Audio Science Review, which from the measurements perspective is a competitor with your, your little mm -hmm. uh, subset of Stereophile. What do you think of those guys? They, they clearly don't do much listening at all. But No, uh, I mean, I, I have a great deal of respect for Amir, who runs the site, 
Yeah. And I'm intensely jealous of the fact that he's got, he's acquired <laughs> one of the Clipple measurement systems, which costs about $100,000. I think he has a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Even if I had $100,000, you need, uh, you need a place to use the clipper which has like at least a 12 foot ceiling because of the need wow. for the, the gantry to go around the speaker so i'm i'm intensely jealous of him he <laughs> does good work um he's the big thing about audio science review i find is that they don't drill down in the measurements they, they publish all the measurements and there's very little attempt or that's not fair there isn't sufficient attempt to correlate what is measured with what is heard. But of course, that's not their game. They're just into the measurements. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I find I, he's, he's, he's very reliable on his measurements, I find. Yeah. John, question about uh, measurements. Um, <clears throat> Dave Slagle brought a, a couple of, I think it was IAR, is that International Audio Review? Yes. I think it was uh, J. Clinton. Peter Moncrief. That's great. Char Charlie, can you lean back just a little bit so we can see your face? All we're seeing is your face. I'll leave the room. There you go. The, um, what was fascinating, apparently in the, uh, this is like issue five, perhaps. And he was trying to come up with new measurements to try to more precisely uh, correlate what the measurements said with the hearing. And that particular issue was on phonocartridges. And he, uh, the whole issue, I mean, it was dozens of pages, but he talked about, or what he came up with was the drop test, the needle drop test. And apparently at the time he had one of the very new uh, spectrum analyzers that could do FFT. I think it was uh, uh, Princeton Applied Research perhaps. Mm -hmm. And he uh, came up with graphs and he, he must have done a dozen cartridges in that issue and um, came up with graphs that he then went through the, looking at the, at the and of course this was frequency response, but it wasn't just the one when you put a B and K, what, 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 whatever it is, and you have your chart recorder going across and it's you know, perfectly straight until whatever. But um, the, the results that he showed seemed to um, agree with the listening results. And I thought to myself, is, has this type of a test it, it's certainly, I never heard of it after that. And I'm wondering if, if any of these tests had any kind of validity in the, in the outside world after that. Well, he's, used, he's, he's, he's basically looking at the impulse response of the cartridge, which will give, yes. you, which will give you all the information you need. Um, I, I have that issue. I'll have to look it up. I haven't read it for many <laughs> years. Um, but yes, I mean, it's, it's giving the impulse response. That will give you a frequency response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, it's, it's valid testing. Has anybody thought about using it uh, if in fact it seems to correlate the measurement of what the cartridge can do to what you hear? Um, I'm wondering, any cartridge manufacturers use it? I don't know. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> me measuring LP playback gear is difficult because it's a, uh, it, it's, a, it's an uncontrolled environment. I mean, my predecessor at Hi-Fi News, John Crabb, did some tests where he, he basically showed that when you play an LP, the LP, the stylus, of course, the, the groove wall excites the stylus. The stylus also excites the groove wall. That results in mechanical transmission into the body of the LP and into the platter which then returns delayed. So you're actually generating reverberation within the body of the LP in the platter. He did some experiments with, with playing an LP with one stylus, I think it was, and then he had another cartridge resting on the plat, or where, I forget how he did it, but nevertheless, yeah. he showed that you could generate reverberation by playing an LP. And I thought, ah, oh, maybe that's what well, that, is why people like the sound of LPs. You're getting a little bit of added sweetness there. <laughs> Michael Fremont, I hope you're not listening. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before we take a look at John's room? I John, I have a few other questions, but I, I think I'd wait till, till you're done because I don't want to bore everybody else with them. 
Do you mind if I, I just want to, while John and Charlie are interacting, I, I just, I have a question for Charlie and I'm just interested in the interaction with John on this. So when you design your tape electronics, Charlie, how much do you rely on, on measurements versus listening to, to them? Well, I, um, certainly the frequency response, because with, with a tape pre, I'm a lot of cases using well, first of all, I, I never see the finished finished product because I'm sending a pre out to somebody that already has a deck, and they're all already going to have a, a, a different, perhaps a different head head in, head in there, a playback head. So I'll I'll uh, I'll adjust the the frequency response at my place and and try to get it as good as what I think if I've got a, a tape head that is close to what they have. But then I'll say, um, you know, you got your high frequency response. John was talking about this earlier, it, because of in, in, even in the RIAA, of, effectively you have a tone control. And if you want to put a variable resistor where the, fixed, where, where the designer has, fix, has assumed the fixed resistor could be, that's fine. But how about if you put a little a pot that can adjust it by plus or minus 30%, we'll say, and then you go put on the record, you could do this for the highs and the lows with a, 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 tape, a phono pre, but not necessarily with a tape pre. You put it on and you listen to it and uh, play with the pot and see what you, what you think. I, I just quickly add, I had a, a, a whole bunch of early two track pre-records from the middle fifties. And if, for those of you who didn't know that a lot of the uh, stereo tapes came out before records and um, if you listen to these across the dozens of different manufacturers, you'll find that I'm not sure that they knew what NAB meant, or there, um, let, let me re-say that, 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 that there was in fact a, a standard tried to be put in and whether or not there was a standard, whether they actually stuck to it. So the idea of having a, I, I love, I love, uh, I, I love uh, tone controls uh, for various reasons, but from a program perspective, if you can go in and play with that a little bit, come on, you can add you can add highs here and there, or you know a lot of the early monos and everything like that, or the early stereos. There's nothing below 100 hertz, and and if you have a something that can play with 120 hertz or something, it it can make quite a difference. But it's let's uh, let let me put it this way: it's your pleasure machine. You enjoy it. Thank you. Good, I drove everybody away. <laughs> I like that actually... comment about it being your pleasure machine and uh, that we should enjoy it. I, I think I subscribe to that. I think Amen. Dick Sequoia gets credit for, uh, for that uh, comment years and years <laughs> ago at one of our meetings describing what our audio systems were. Who, who got credit for that? Dick Sequoia. Oh. Yeah, Dick. Dick said, you know, it's it's it, he he addressed he's addressed a couple of our Christmas meetings, and uh, the, the the last time he was there, he he made the very salient point, which which Mike picked up on. He said, you know, it's your pleasure machine, and if it's not giving you pleasure, find another hobby. Uh, hey, John, I have a question for you. Yeah. So. Um... Uh, regarding speaker design, echoing. Um, the only organization that I've heard that seems to use music as a source and uh, you know, helping produce the, their speakers is the BBC. Uh, do other uh, manufacturers do anything like this? I, to be honest, I just, I don't know. Um, I assume they do. Um, but I have no personal knowledge of it. The design papers for several of the BBC monitors talk about trying them out in a control room and then listening to the actual live performance and then mm -hmm. going back to the control room. They also talk a lot about comparing speech, uh, just a single speaker uh the live person versus the speaker mm -hmm. john in 20 years of your reviews is stuff getting better 
like electronics and uh, maybe, I don't know, you, you're mentioning the point that speakers, you're really listening kind of to the, 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 what the view of the person that developed it, but is stuff getting better? Um, I would say yes. Yes, but you're seeing a split in the market. You're seeing a split between products traditionally designed traditionally, traditional measurements, distortion, lower and distortion, lower noise. Um, and then you're also seeing products which have a distinctive sound, which are not necessarily neutral. Um, so but if, remember, the products designed to traditional measurements are getting better and better. And then you have the products which have, or shall we say that have idiosyncratic sound qualities and therefore idiosyncratic measurements. And I would say both are, that, that split is getting larger than it ever has in the past. No kidding. Isn't that something? Anyway. I, I have a question, actually. Um, uh, John, do you see people under 30 uh, coming into this hobby at all? I mean, do you see interest in sound quality or hi-fi in, you know, quote unquote, young people? Sadly, no. I have three children. You, they, none of them have any interest in listening to music except on their phone or at, as, on, as background on TV. You know, my, my son has music playing on the TV, streaming on the TV while he's doing something else. But my, my children, ages between, you know, uh, 20, well, 28 and 38 now, seem to have missed it, even and though they've had an opportunity to experience it. The, the good news, though, is that at the hi-fi shows, I do see that maybe like uh, 5% of the the attendees are under 40 and uh, a few under 30. Not enough, though. 5%. No, okay. it's, it would be great if it was more, but uh, definitely see a, a few that are interested, at least. And yeah. And I've heard anecdotally that a lot of the enthusiasm for records uh, the renewed enthusiasm for records is those in their 20s. Yeah, I suppose I, it's funny. I had the exact same question as Jeff did, like at the exact same moment. What do you think it means, though, if so? I mean, if you, we're just looking at this group as the membership and in, in our, you know, making all our judgments about who, how old everyone is, um, like, what does it mean if if there's no one in this group under under 40, under 30? Like what happens to these manufacturers? What happens as we all Die. age and move to Florida? And, <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. You know? <laughs> well, I think you see this happening in, in the marketplace. <clears throat> that manufacturers are, if you're a manufacturer, you're making a much smaller number of a much more expensive model than you did 10 years ago because it's a safer business strategy to target rich older people than it is to try and sell something affordable to people under 40. And I think you see that, but you see that's been happening in the market for 10 years now. I think one of the things we, you know, we're focusing on the gear, but it's important to note that young people are listening to music all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that, I think, is, is a far more important factor than that they're not going out and spending a ton of money on audio gear. Um, Good point, Mike. Music is not being lost. No. Right. I'm, but, a, I'm a high school teacher, and what I try to, I've told my kids at times when they talk about it, like, they can walk around with their beats, you know, some of which are of very low quality, some of which are actually okay, or, or they can actually spend less money get something you know good and, and kind of appreciate it but it's it's more about the experience and having the brand name and, and the culture of the thing than um you know but I, i've been with high schoolers for for 20 years and i haven't seen anything to indicate that a lot of these kids really value it you know well it's sort of like like it's sort of like the famous frank zappa quote about uh you know music becoming wallpaper for our lifestyles you know mm -hmm. that seems to have been achieved unfortunately Although Chris's comment was interesting about uh, records, maybe there's a transition from listening to vinyl to thinking, well, this could sound better and I could get more out of it. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if that's a, a way forward for history. 
See, I think the Beats was a breakthrough in a way because it got kids off the earbuds. <laughs> so now the thing is, what's the next Beats? Mm -hmm. You know, what what can you do now? Can you can you do something that looks cool, that's a lifestyle product, but actually sounds a little bit better? They're out, not, they are out well, there. Well, some people say the Apple's AirPods Max headphones, noise canceling headphones that are five hundred fifty dollars are that. Mm. Yeah, maybe. But doesn't it seem? Doesn't it seem we're speaking mostly of a portable type medium? Where yes. Is no. Yes. Yeah. Kids. Yes. Kids are yeah. not interested in. That's what kids want. Yeah, they're not interested in big speakers in a room and sitting no still way. and listening to them. No way. Yeah. I think but with Spotify introducing a lossless service, I mean, I, did, I assume you all saw the Billie Eilish video last week. Maybe yeah. that will be the way forward. When I was uh, a kid, uh, all of the hi-fi equipment came with bass and treble controls, but you were apparently expected to leave them, you know, straight up on the bass, straight up on the treble. And I always looked at it and thought, look, you've got these bass and treble controls on there, adjust them to make the music sound the way you want it to sound. Search me. By, this, by the same token, uh, when I was a kid, and probably most of you too, uh, we started listening on transistor radios, and the music translated through that medium, and that was the music at the time. And the only people I knew that had great uh, sound systems were old men, because they could afford it, right? It's a little bit like, I, I worked in agriculture, and every year the, they publish statistics, and they say, oh, the average age of farmers is 55 years. They're all going to die soon. Well, no, it takes till 55 to be able to own a farm. So yeah. I, I think that's a part when of I, it. Yeah, when I was a teenager, the biggest influence, one of the biggest influences was our local audio dealer. But, you know, he, he it was called the record shop, but he had a hi-fi section and a record section. So all us kids would go in to listen to the latest albums that were coming out. And he'd say, hey, kid, come upstairs. I got these new speakers, you got to listen. So there was I, you know, 17 years old, sat down in front of a pair of quad electrostatics. Mm. And I, it was like, wow. But he said, <laughs> you know, I said, I can't afford these. He said, I know, but one day you will. <laughs> I yeah, know those are, those are the good business owners that realize that you may be back two, three years down the road, be it a car dealer or a hi-fi dealer that they they in, uh, inspire the young occasionally with little yeah. opportunities like that. So I had similar uh, opportunities as a young person that gave me enthusiasm for hi-fi and cars. Yeah. So do you want to see my listening room? Absolutely. Okay. So I apologize for the shaky camera. I'm not trying to put my thumb over, over it. You could uh, flip to the other camera if you want. If you can find the button, can you do that? Zoom. Yeah, there's a option to flip to the other camera and zoom. I think on the iPad it's in the upper right, maybe. Oh, I see it. Switch camera. Yep. There you go. There we go. All right. So, okay. Oh, it's not enough. Not wide enough angle. So, this is looking at the business end. You can see the Martin speakers I'm using. See the Martin speakers, Parasound amps, um, rack on the left has my air, universal player, Pass Labs preamp. Um, the uh, Rune Nucleus is sitting there on top of the air. There's a, as I walk around, there's a PS Audio DAC and an MBL DAC, which I'm using right now. Um, so I go around the room, you can see there's my Lin. Um, Underneath is on the bottom is my um, channel D phono preamp. On the little table is the metric halo audio interfaces I use for measuring in room sound and for making recordings. The air um, USB A to D converter I use. I plug the output of the channel D phono preamp into that, send it digitally to the DAC um, desk where all the writing gets done. Um, have various things around. Um, 
the listening chair. I hope mine didn't fall over. CDs everywhere, of course. Um, then that's where I do all my listening. That's where I do all my writing. Um, I have bookshelves on all the walls and L, and L sorry, for motion, whole racks of LPs there's underneath the books. Uh, there's an armoire there that has all my headphones and has all my music editing stuff. Um, another rack, which is equipment I'm not currently using. Um, a Sago palm that lives in the listening room during the winter. And then on this side of the room, lots and lots of books and magazines, guitars, a keyboard I can't play very well, if at all. And then the back of the room, more books, more SACDs, more guitars. John, I'm surprised how many records you have, because I don't think I've ever read a review from you that you uh, used a vinyl source for any sort of referencing. I, I have done. I mean, I find, maybe it's my age, but I started a project of archiving all my, my vinyl to 24 192 files using the Air ATD converter, which really is a superb sounding ATD converter. And then I've recently realized that I don't have enough time left in my life to finish doing that project. So now I just grab the LPs out and play them when I want. Although since I bought the Rune Nucleus, I have to say that I use the Rune for 90% of my listening. It's so easy just to sit there and stream music and read the, um, read the liner notes on screen, have Rune decide what I want to listen to next based on what I've just listened to. It's like an endless story of exploration. And you just saw my, one of my cats, three cats disappear behind the speaker. Um, yeah, so that's, that's it. That's my listening room. Um, it's a it's little asymmetry. Um, you're not allowed up there. You see, <laughs> See, I've got a couple of steps up to the vestibule um, and, then, and then this side of the room, sorry if I have a motion, is a little longer than the other side. So it's a little asymmetric. I've got tube traps in all the corners. Oh, yeah. um, what I went for when I did this room and some RPG absorbers there, what I went for in this room when we bought it, it was originally it was the, it's in the basement of our house in Brooklyn, and it was originally a dentist's office. The, this room was originally, there was a corridor leading down from these steps. Um, then this was the waiting room for the patients. And to the left of the bookshelves, where that Porgy and Best poster is, was another room, which was an office. Um, further down the hall is the old dentist lab, which is now my test lab, um, but another surgery, which we use as a box room and another surgery, uh, sorry, a second surgery, which is now my wife's office. And so I knocked this room into one, got rid of the corridor, got rid of the wall. So what was the corridor of the office and the waiting room is now one large room. Longest dimension on this side is 25 feet. It's 70 foot wide, um, eight, eight, I think it's an eight foot ceiling. And what I tried to do was, I, I'm a book lover, I've been a bookworm all my life. So it was to create walls which were dispersive, not reflect, you know, so that the service the room is actually not dead. It's got a pretty even reverb time, of about 250 milliseconds from 400 Hertz upwards to the low treble. Above that, it shortens just to the absorption. But the idea was to make it a room where speaking voice sounded relatively natural and not over dead, so that coloration would be minimal. There's no slap e echo with all this, you know, books and records and CDs everywhere. A bit of acoustic damping from the cat there. <laughs> so, so um, that, that's this. I've been here twenty years, and um, I, I, it's a, it's, it's a good room for analyzing the sound of audio components and loudspeakers. It's a, it's a little drier than most people's rooms, but as I said, it's uncolored. John, I have a yeah. question. I've noticed a an electrical panel box on your wall. Do you have? Yes, I had that put in. 
Um, the main entrance, electricity comes into the house in the, in the vestibule. So I had that circuit breaker box put in and it's only, you know, the runs I have, um, there's very short AC runs to, to, the, um, to the outlets for the audio system. Um, Thank you. So yeah, I always felt, you know, AC power is important. When I lived in Santa Fe, I had a dedicated line put into the listening room, which made a big, big difference to the sound. Uh, and then have a cat come in. John, one of the things. Curiosity, John, uh, have you ever had one of your cats use uh, one of your speakers as a scratching post? No, no, they're pretty well behaved. Um, uh. John, uh, one of the things that I've found too. over uh, can make a, quite a difference in your experience is moving your uh, chair, your listening position, for, as far as its distance from the speakers. Oh, wow. Do you experiment with that at one occasionally? I, uh, the, the listening chair stays pretty much where it is. Um, speakers, I, over the years, I've, I've marked. I marked with blue tape everywhere I speak everywhere I put speakers and they all tend to congregate pretty much in the same position. Um, some like the golden air tritons I reviewed a while back needed to be further out. Others like, like the um, Sonus Fathers I review in the um, May issue, no, the April issue should have been closer to the wall, but you can see from the stairs on this steps to this side and the little balustrade, I can't get speakers closer to the wall behind. So that, that's something I have to live with. John, this brings up another question. Um, <clears throat> for, for civilians like us who don't have the audio precision rig, um, is, there, is there a way we can measure acoustics in our room and improve our listening experience with these iPhone apps? Um, I would say the best app is, um, is REW. It's, it's a shareware and it's got terrific functionality. So if you use it with um, an inexpensive microphone, like one of the ones Dayton Audio Cells, that would give you good results. Dayton Audio themselves, themselves has the Omnimic system, which I own, I don't use. I find the interface rather clunky, but it actually is, is a, a good way of measuring speakers in rooms. Tom Norton, you, you know, our reviewer Tom Norton uses Omnimic. Um, I use, you know, I use Melissa, which I've been using since 1989 because I'm so comfortable with it. And I find it, this functionality is everything I need. Um, there's fuzz measure, which used to be a good value, but it's now a lot more expensive. I use that for my in-room measurements. Um, but REW, I would say, is the go-to solution with an inexpensive measurement microphone, like the Dayton Audio MM6, which I think is like $58. And what what is you what useful measurements for like if a person if a person says well geez you know I I have these new speakers or I borrowed these speakers from a friend and they they just don't sound right in this room what what would you measure and and how would you change the position of the speaker um, to perhaps improve that more to your liking? Well, I I wrote an article on this back in two thousand eight, which is on the Stereophile site, and I started by recommending something Gordon Holt talked about, which is just, yeah, just swap the camera back, which is uh, you just, you sit in your listening chair and you get a friend to speak. And he speaks in the various positions you're thinking about where to put speakers and where his voice sounds the most natural is your starting point for putting the speakers. It's, it's very simple but it's, it's very effective. Um, you then, oh, sorry, the cats are fighting. Um, you then fine tune the positioning and you move each speaker half an inch at a time. Use one of the, something like the Bosch laser um, measurer, which will, you know, put it, put it under your chin. That speaker, that speaker, make sure they're the same distance from you. Um, it's, you know, it's just keep on trying to get optimize that position. But the starting point is where your friend's voice sounds most natural, that's where you should start.
Thanks, John. I guess he dropped the mic, huh, guys? <laughs> that told the whole story. John, um, do you use a subwoofer with your LS50s? Uh, no. You're, you're talking about the voice. Uh, as somebody moving around the room with their voice made me think of the subwoofer crawl technique. Yeah, I I've, I've, with it. I've tried And I was wondering about how you tweak subs if or if you... I, I've them. tried subwoofers over the years. I've never had enough success integrating them with the main speakers. Cal Rubinson is probably the most successful reviewer I, I know who's integrated subwoofers in his system. But as I said, within, I mean, with, within their loudness limitations and within, you know, they'll, they'll, within their low frequency limitations, the LS50s actually create that magic window into the console hall for me. Yeah, if, if, as long great. as I can accept the image on pianos and orchestras being smaller than it should be. Mm -hmm. I visited Michael Fremer last month to measure the Wilson Chronosonics XVXs that he's reviewing for the May issue. And I have to say that, that everything was the right size on that system. <laughs> Except for the measure. price tag. Yeah, and they weigh 685 pounds, so we couldn't move them for the measurements, which was a pain. <laughs> John? Uh, we saw your the power panel in your room there. Do you use any kind of power treatment on your? Yes, I have an AudioQuest Niagara 5000, which I didn't think would make a difference, and it did. I use that for the power amplifiers. And then I have an AudioQuest Niagara 1000 into which the source components are plugged. And it gives that, I, it's not that the, there was background noise before, but everything seems cleaner. But it's like it's like when you're watching TV and you turn the lights off and you get maximum contrast on the television screen. The blacks get blacker. It's that's that, that kind of effect. Mm -hmm. So why, John? Scientifically, why? Because I'm uh, very skeptical about those, but I can be convinced if there's science. I don't know why. I wish I did. I, I've seen fairly convincing explanations that there can be noise on the electrical lines that 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 all all the machines that we use, the motors, the lights and so forth, generate feedback. It's a two way circuit, really. You know, there are things we think of the electricity coming in, but but interference can also go the other way. And I, I, I bought it, I guess. And mm -hmm. I like like John, I, I I bought one of those conditioners and I thought I'd return it when I tried it and things just were a little bit clearer. It was like late night listening as opposed to midday yeah, listening. That's exactly the experience. Then, uh, how about the trellis grounding? Uh, sorry, we're talking over each other or sorry. somebody. Uh, John, did you ever ask the power company what the total harmonic distortion of the power supplied to your home was? No, I, I looked at it many, many years ago, and it was it was like one or two percent, if I remember correctly. Interesting, because I just uh, installed a whole house emergency generator made by Cummins, and they quoted something on the order of about five percent total harmonic distortion. So I went to our utility company uh, here in Ontario, <coughs> I asked them what the total harmonic distortion was of the power that they were feeding into the Toronto area. And they either couldn't answer it or wouldn't answer it or couldn't tell me or couldn't put me in touch with the person that could have that answer for me. So I gave Probably up. No one ever asked that question before. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's, that, it's, that's, it's, yeah, that's the, precisely the problem. Well, it's, it, it's a it, common it question. It's a common question. I, I work for the power company, and um, it, it varies. It depends where you are on the grid. If you're out way, way out, miles out in the middle of nowhere, or you're, if you're in, in town, it also has to it happens with the, the time of day, what's going on during the day, because you could, if you're down the road, if you're a block away from a machine shop, that's using uh, voltage converters or, or, or something where they're um, you're switching power there, it, it can be very, very dirty. That's why most of you read most of this stuff and they'll say late at night is you're gonna get your, your lowest harmonic distortion. 
cleanest late at night is what you're saying. Yes. So what is a power conditioner doing to, is that what it's going after the harmonic distortion in the, in the 60 Hertz frequency, or is it, or well, is it noise reduction? Remember also every component is generating noise on, 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 I mean, you have the, it's the AC input from the wall yet, but it's also then going to a diode bridge, which is switching at 120 Hertz. And that for switching noise, I assume is then being fed back through the AC wiring into the house wiring. So the conditioner, presumably, this is conjecture on my part, is actually cleaning it up for everything else in the system. I, I have an application that monitors my incoming AC and tells me usage by device. Uh, if anybody's interested now, I have the screen on my other window that shows the incoming line voltage and frequency and dips and whatnot. Uh, if anybody have any interest, I could just show the screen just to show what's available to show what's coming yeah. in which might be a you know a little more validity to a conditioner so I, I can i assume the screen at this point share screen i think oh okay now how do i get to i think we're I, getting into the weeds on a, a subtopic well, well, we, it's, it's, we just, can... it's just a very quick visual and i don't know how to share my screen if it'll well, be any... then well, then let's revisit some other time Oh my God, wait, 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 oh, nope, 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 nope. Okay, yeah, if anybody would be interested in something like that offline at another time, I'd be glad to have show and have some fun with this. It's kind of interesting. It monitors usage against consumption and my solar production and a lot of other fun things, keeps me occupied. Um, how do you uh, comment? Go ahead and comment. Okay, um, just from the perspective, noise. Uh, on the power line, uh, we had a user that was uh, getting some noise in his uh, phono playback setup and um, really worked hard to try to track down the origin of this. And it turned out he had a sump pump in an outbuilding that was generating some high frequency noise back on the power line and it was getting back into his house. He solved it with an isolation transformer on the sump pump, but the point is is that sometimes these degradations can be less obvious and harder to track down that can subtly degrade the quality of the audio in, this, in the sound system. So just keep in mind that it's a continuum of really terrible effect on the, power, on the audio system to something that's really subtle and a whole bunch of range in between. Um, and a lot of the power conditioners can address that. Um, it's usually better to try to find out the source of the problem, but just keep in mind that, um, that it's not just a binary thing. It's a very gray zone where it can happen and you, you can drive yourself crazy trying to understand uh, what's causing the problem. Thanks. Yeah, everything's subject to change. You could have a neighbor install a piece of equipment uh, tomorrow that causes you issues that for years you never had a problem. One elegant thing I found when I came to the United States was that you actually have balanced power distributed to the house. In England, right. we had single ended 240. Here you have plus or minus 110 or 100 plus or minus 120 on opposite phases. So <clears throat> in England, in the evenings, you suddenly notice your amplifier humming physically because people were turning on their televisions, which was with so many of them, they're putting DC onto a single single ended AC line. And oh, so yeah. the DC on the, on the AC power line is making transformers vibrate, <coughs> saturating the core. You don't have that in the United States, I don't think with the um, plus or minus supply. Les Tarazi, you have a question? Yes, um, I was uh, just, I think yesterday or the day before, tuning in to Amir on his uh, YouTube channel, and he did a review on one of the lesser AudioQuest noise suppressor surge protectors. I think it was like a $300 unit, so it was not a fancy piece. <clears throat> in his analysis, um, by the way, he lives in Seattle, 
and he mentioned that he was having 3% distortion coming in on his power lines. Um, he did his test of the AudioQuest piece and he found zero influence. It did nothing as far as he was concerned. So he said, I just save you 300 bucks. Now he did not test Niagara's. So I don't know about that level, but since Amir came up a little bit earlier, the ASR thing, uh, I thought I'd just toss that out. Rob Dorak, you have a question? Yeah, hi, John. I've kind of a philosophical question for you. What do you view as the, like the function of magazines like Stereophile, Absolute Sound, when there were more of them? Are they, you know, on one end, are they just entertainment for audio hobbyists? Are they a quasi scientific um, resource? Um, and what do you, how do you think of what Stereophile does or what it's supposed to be doing? It's, it's, it's a multifaceted goal. Obviously, you're imparting information. You're, you're, in a sense, you're educating readers both to the hobby, the audio theory, the audio engineering, and what products they should be investigating. But um, as I found when I was a high school science teacher, you, can't, you have to also entertain. You have to make people, you, you have to have your readers enjoying themselves when they read what might otherwise be a dry academic paper. So you, ed, you inform, you educate, and you entertain, and all three of those things are important. Um, if you just entertain, well, then it's, I guess, like a, like a five guys burger. It's there and it's gone and that's the end of it. But I, my goal for the magazines I've edited, Hi-Fi News and Ministeriophile, was those three things. You, you, you educate, you inform, you entertain, and you want them to come back next month for more. <laughs> yeah. I think that was definitely the uh, Stereophile is an example of success with those goals. Yeah, yeah. Thank John, you. Can I, can I venture a question on, on headphones? Uh, Stereophile acquired, I guess, Inner Fidelity sometime. We, we, launched, we launched Inner Fidelity. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, back in uh, 2007, was it? I'm trying to remember when exactly it was. But we realized that... <clears throat> There were two areas which were burgeoning, headphone listening and vinyl playback. And we didn't, we couldn't expand the magazine to cover those two subjects in depth. So we launched two websites, Inner Fidelity and Audio Stream. And sorry, and for Audio Stream for computer audio and Analog Planet for vinyl. Um, Analog Planet we um, acquired from Michael Fremer. Uh, audio Stream we launched. And we hired Michael Lavonia to be the editor, who is currently, you know, looking for a job. And Inner Fidelity came about because I was at a Rocky Mountain Audio Fest, and I bumped into Tyle Hertzens, and he said, "He said, oh, what are you doing, Tyle?" He said, "Oh, I, the new owners of um, Headroom have fired me." So I said, "I have just the job for you." So we <laughs> launched those three sites, um, and they. They took off on various uh, trajectories. Um, Analog Planet is still going, has been relatively successful. Audio Stream never generated enough page views for some reason. Inner Fidelity went, was going great guns and then Tyler decided he was gonna retire fit and tour the country in a camper van, which he's still doing. So without Tile, um, Rafe Arnott replaced him, but Tile was a, one of a kind personality. Yeah, he was a and great guy. So, I loved, I loved him and, and yeah, his work. So, so we absorbed in a fidelity and audio stream into the high fi into the Stereophile website, and so then I was just down to Analog Planet plus Stereophile. Yeah, that I get. Thank you for explaining because I, I, uh, I, I just recently have come to appreciate Tile, and he, yeah. he's to be on a one man mission to make sense of headphones. You know. Yeah. With, yes. Yes, I, I, and all of his headphone reviews are archived now on the Stereophile site. 
Do, well, do you see anybody ahead. picking up that work, or is it? It's sort of. No, unless Tile decides to buy a house and settle down. <laughs> Herb's Herb's doing a great job with uh, headphones, I think. Yes, yes. Herb has 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 stepped into that void. Although Herb has other responsibilities as well. But Tyler was one of a kind. Very good, very good. I, but and my compliments to you. I I think you find just the right balance of measurements and listening. I do really appreciate. Thank you. The, Thank you. The, I feel there's a scientific vision that sort of drives what you're doing, but at the same time, you you stop short of dictating what people should like, you know, so that, that's the good balance. Thank you, thank you. John, I've got two questions. Um, one is uh, the Ayer QB920, have you been able to hear it? Have you, uh, what do you think of it? No, I mean, I, I was a fan of the original QB9. Um, never got round to listening to the new version. Okay. Suppose Second, I should. Question. Second question. We had uh, Merrill from his company give us, I guess, our last uh, mm -hmm. talk. On, yeah, our last meeting was with Merrill yeah, Audio. Yeah, on the, uh, I was going to say silicon carbide, but I guess it's gall gallium arsenide. Gallium, uh, uh, gallium nitride, I think it is. Gallium GAS. nitride. Anyway, he was saying apparently that these new amps, that the new technology, the uh, what we was talking about leading and falling edges, apparently they're they're um, they're unsurpassed. And um, what he what I heard him say that was interesting was when they they bring out this technology on speakers, people were um, they love it except apparently in the bass, and he had when he was talking about the design of the amplifier, he was saying how they had to go in and check that, that the, the, what is it, the low pass filters on the output, they had to do their own, have their own built up because they were distorting. And um, it just got me wondering if, uh, could this technology, if it gets adopted, mean the end of passive crossovers and speakers? I'm not sure I understand the question because if it, if I didn't I didn't attend the Merrill Merrill's of, um, talk, but if it's just he's talking about gallium nitride transistors, well, they themselves are not going to be they're going to have their own uh, behavior. You can't just drop them into an existing circuit based on bipolars or or, or FETs. Uh, but I don't see why just the difference in device would have that effect. But it, it, if I heard him, what he was saying, I was thinking, is that the, the rise and fall times of these devices are, for all I know, more orders of magnitude better. Oh, I see. So you for see, switching it, for, for switching. Well, that's, again, that's what they're doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so and then when they're putting it through at the, at the back end, when you have to put it through the low pass filter to get your audio signal out, he was finding that they had to specially design the L. They they were the the, the inductors were distorting. Okay, so so with the very much uh, reduced rise time of the switching, that's producing much higher levels of ultrasonic noise, and that's overloading the inductors in the low pass field. Yeah, the and, and I understand. And then he was he was saying when when the, the the initial responses of people to what the amp is sounding like is the people if they were having any kind of a problem it was in the bass. And I'm thinking to myself, or I even said, I said, well, what do you see when you have your, your, your woofer, you have a big honking inductor in series with it. And, and all of a sudden, could that be all of, in, you know, in other words, could passives in some of, the, some of these applications, maybe the passive crossovers, if this, if this new technology for amps is good enough, now you could be exposing flaws in traditional speaker designs. I am a little skeptical because I mean, the low pass filter on the amplifier's output is going to be eliminating most of the ultrasonic energy. You're probably going to be left with three or 400 millivolts, which is not going to be enough to, to, to cause problems in passive crossover components, I would have thought. Okay. Okay. But I'll Thank you. wait and see till I test one of these <laughs> new amplifiers with gallium nitride devices. 
again, I guess the entrance price of those is fifteen or twenty thousand dollars. So, oh well. Yeah. John, I have a question for you. Can you tell us what what sort of music do you like to listen to in your listening room? Like what when when it's just a pleasure day, you're not having to measure something. You just what what do you come back to? Bach. No kidding. <laughs> and, and as I get older, I listen to more and more chamber music. I find that orchestral music that I used to love, like, you know, Berlioz Symphony Fantastique. When I, when I was in my 20s, I loved it. Now I just find it overblown and sound effects for the sake of sound effects. And I, I, am, I still love Sibelius symphonies, especially number two and number five. Um, but I'm finding a lot of the music, the audiophile music, like the Berlioz, like the Stravinsky Rite of Spring. As I said, it, it's as I get older, it's sounding more like sound effects than music. And then I listen to, you know, a Bach keyboard partita, and it's like that's the real stuff. It's for, it's for music without the without the um, byproducts, I guess. Fascinating. So your your taste tends toward acoustic instruments, though. No, I mean I like I mean, you know I I still when I want to rock I put on Little Feet Waiting for Columbus. Um, <laughs> there's um, you know, I, Stephen Mahias when he was at the magazine turned me onto a lot of EDM um, and alternative music, um, but for classical music, as I said, I'm my tastes are going towards. The, uh, the more simple, the more straightforward, the music is, is laid more bare. John, in, in, that, uh, in that same vein, is it uh, fair to say that, uh, that, that having a different system for different kinds of music is probably the ultimate uh, way to go? No, I think the one system should, whatever music you play on it, whether, you know, today I play Bach, tomorrow I play Billie Eilish, it should be the same. It should get the most from whatever music you need at that moment in time. Interesting. I never was a fan of the old, you know, back in the 60s where you had the West Coast sound with JBL 100s and the East Coast sound with ARLSTs. I, I thought I was just silly. John, I'd like to make a little comment. Uh, most of us have gone through this audio journey, going through various phases, equipment, speakers, set up, different types of gear. And you made a comment the last time you were visiting us. 2013, I guess. And you said something interesting, which was obvious, but not obvious. You know, someone says the obvious and you suddenly realize, yes, it's obvious that we never really get real music in front of us. Even the, it's just an illusion. Everything is an illusion. And it sort of made me think for a while. And pretty much since that time, beside doing all the normal audio setups, uh, using measurements, uh, listening to different gear, uh, I find myself m modifying everything to get the best illusion. And whether I'm listening to a single singer with a guitar or a log orchestra, I manage to get the best illusion. And that's how I pick gear and set up my equipment. And mm -hmm. it's been very satisfying doing that. And uh, you're right. You, with, one, with one setup, you can listen to all of it if you just take the time to get the best illusion. Yeah, exactly the case. The, um, I, it was, uh, oh gosh, um, I forget who said it, but it was the, the, the ear brain is a detective looking for clues. And the more clues you can give the brain to create the illusion of the experience, the better the experience will be. The less work, you have to do to create that illusion. John. Um... It was Peter Cra ah, I remember it was Peter Craven, one of the developers MQA. He, he said that at a AES conference in 2007, the, 
the ear is detective looking for clues give you know give the ear brain more clues don't give them the ear brain confusing clues don't make the brain work as hard as it have to as it has to john uh one thing that you may find interesting um i was in hospital uh, a couple of years ago and um i was in a ward with uh, a couple of other guys and one of them had a really neat over the ear headphone that he was listening to his music with and he let me listen to it and i was so blown away with it when i got out i went and bought one for myself it was a monster uh over the ear headset and i could set it up to to work with bluetooth or direct connection and so on but i was absolutely blown with the uh sound that i was hearing with that headset and believe me i've i've listened to an awful lot of headsets uh, over a great many years but this one really blew me apart and so uh, what's the model name oh i don't have it anywhere near me right now but it, the, is the, this uh, the, is this a model from like five years ago from like a year ago this this was about three years ago okay uh but the uh the cost of this thing was like about 150 bucks where i bought it and that was Canadian dollars as well. So just to, to give you an idea. But, um, uh, you know, I, uh, the way I look at it is if something sounds good and sings to you, buy it. Is it uh, possibly called the Monster Persona? No. If, if you'd really like to know, I, I'll uh, go and put my hands on it and I can tell you. All right. For those who don't know, an interesting point, uh, we talked about Beats a little bit earlier. Monster headphones were originally built by Beats. That's how mm -hmm. Monster headphones was launched uh, by uh, a partnership between Beats and Monster Cable. And Beats is now owned by Apple, right, Chris? Right. They were bought a bunch of years ago. And... Uh, they're still maintaining it as a as a brand, but uh, Apple's certainly been coming up with their own headphones as well. Chris, my wife has just uh, gone to uh, dig them out, and I'll tell you what it is. Great. Um, speaking of headphones, John, some what are some of your favorite headphones? You showed us that you've got a, a stack of them there in your room. What, so what yeah, are some of your I... favorites? But my um, go-to headphones for music are Audis, Audis, Audis LCDXs that I reviewed uh, 2014, I think. Bought the review pair. I'm still using them. Um, I have a pair of uh, Sony HD, uh, sorry, Sennheiser HD 650s I've owned for years, which I used to use a lot on recording sessions because they're light and I can wear them all day without my neck hurting. I uh, have a pair of the uh, much earlier Sennheiser 580s, which I had before the 650s. Um, have a pair of Sony MDR 7506s, which John Dunlavey recommended to me because he felt they were the least colored headphone he'd ever tried. Um, I've, that was, gosh, 25 years ago. Still have them, except the, the earpieces are all falling to pieces. Um, and that, that's, that's pretty much my current current lineup. I have a pair of um, ultimate ears, in-ears monitors that I use when I'm out walking. Uh, that, that's about it. John, have you considered testing headphones? No. Like set, setting up but, a dummy I mean, head rig or something? No, I mean, I, I, I mean, Tile had a, had a dummy head rig for testing. Um, Keith Howard had one, which he was using for Hi-Fi News in the UK. I never felt the need to, to go down that direction, given the work Tile was doing for us. Uh, Graham, do they have uh, any identification on them? Yeah, it says Monster Clarity HD Wireless. Well, there you go. Thanks for sharing. Any more questions or thoughts from people? 
So I think we should wrap up soon. So, so John, in your retirement, uh, are you, you're, you're just going to be, um, I, excuse me, I shouldn't say just, but you're going to be continuing to review, uh, review a lot of stuff I'm oh, sorry, yes. the technical measurements in stereo. Yes, when, when, I, when I decided I needed to retire, I, I did a contract with AV Tech who owns Stereophile and Hi-Fi News, et cetera. But I would continue doing all the measurements, continue yeah. reviewing. And the other thing I did, because I felt I needed in retirement to keep busy, was I prepare all the magazine's content for posting on the website. Yeah. And that, that keeps me busy. Wonderful. Which has been very important this last year when I've hardly left the house. <laughs> Although now I've had my vaccinations. <laughs> when should I venture out onto the subway again? Hey, you're always welcome to, to come or, you know, either into a Zoom meeting or come to our, uh, you know, our meetings if we ever have them again in person because you're just a great, a great person. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank if? you. And, and ditto on the always open door to the group. Yeah, definitely. But, it, but it's not an if. The, this group will be meeting in person again. <laughs> yeah, 2022, I think we will all have lives that are almost <laughs> yeah. like normal. Sooner, I hope. <laughs> John, this this is one instance where being a bunch of old people, the, the only people interested in the, in the stereos anymore, they'll be vaccinated first. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I, I mean... I miss traveling. I mean, I have two grandchildren in England that I now haven't seen for almost two years. I was, my wife and I were going to go back last summer and spend some time with them. Of course, I had to abandon that plan. So, um, uh, FYI, John, our first in person meeting that we have planned for later this year, uh, I believe it's uh, beginning of October, is uh, going to be an outdoor listening session. So to be oh. safe, we're going to stay outside, but we're going to uh, listen to some great tunes. Yeah, but what speakers? Speakers behave <laughs> so differently when there's no walls oh. around them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably going to be horn speakers because the host is a, a lover of horn speakers. He's not with us right now to tell us what he has might have in mind, but. Cool. I should bring my old Ampex 620. <laughs> powered speakers because they that all of their go. testing this was before anacolic chambers they they buried the speakers in a sandbox and huh. did all of their testing in open air um and they're they're essentially flat from about 30 hertz to about um 10 kilohertz and then then they drop off substantially because they're um you know a single driver jbl speaker well i'm guessing andy's not going to want to lug those big jbls outdoors so <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can officially take you up on that offer right now. <laughs> hey, we're all old. We can't hear the top octave anyways. <laughs> what? <laughs> Actually, John, do you do you have any, have you l listened to many speakers outside that you have any uh, comments or suggestions on what might be good for us to use? No, no. My, my last experience was when my uh, sister-in-law got married. We put some speakers outside so people could dance. And the first thing you notice is there's no highs at all. <laughs> hey, John, this, this brings up one more topic I was hoping you could cover. Um, can you talk about, you, you started out when you were in England, you were actually in a rock and roll band, right? That had, that had a yes. recording contract? Uh, yeah, I, I, I've written about this in, in, in the magazine and on the website, but um, uh, my, my education was in sciences, uh, but I also played violin at school, um, also clarinet, guitars, bass guitar, and left, left, graduated from grammar school, went to university, and studied uh, physics and chemistry, got my bachelor's degree, and then the drummer in one of the local bands I played with called me and said, I was working in a lab, and he called me and said, I've met this singer songwriter. He's got a record deal with Warner Brothers. He wants a band to go on the road with, will you join us? And I said, yes. And then I told my wife and then I quit my job and I went on the road with them. And we had, uh, we made an album at Abbey Road. It was gonna be released on Warner Brothers. We had supposed to have an American tour to promote the album. And then 
the manager ran off with the advance from Warners. Abbey Road never got paid, the album didn't come out, and four months after leaving my job at the laboratory, I was unemployed. So um, spent the next, well, that was, that was in the fall of 72. Um, did whatever musical jobs I could find, working in um, pit orchestras, working in, um, in, in nightclubs, working in ballrooms in their bands. And then the same drummer put me in touch with a band called Carla from Australia, who was gonna to tour England, had an album out and their bass player got deported. So I joined them and did a tour of England. That was in 73, spring of 73. Then I got fired from that because the bass player, the Australian bass player came back. And then I worked um, various gigs, nightclubs, cabaret clubs, pit orchestras. And then same drummer again said, the guy who, the singer songwriter who we, we, we were gonna be famous with, with Warner Brothers album, with, with the Warner Brothers album, he just got assigned a deal with DJM records and we're gonna put the band back together again and we're gonna make an album. So that's what I did, 75 through 76. We'd also played backup for Helen Shapiro for some time. So then we made an album on DJM, came out, got great critical reception and hardly sold. So, um, so yeah, a lot of experience playing in bands and I, I miss it. it up on streaming? Uh, I don't know. Um, Discogs has the info on the various albums I was on. Um, and then my then wife said, you know, I, I was having, I was having a problem getting paid still a problem with musicians, I believe. And my then wife said, look, there's an ad in the Guardian newspaper, Hi-Fi News Magazine wants an assi editorial assistant. You have a Hi-Fi, you read Hi-Fi News, apply for the job. <laughs> and I, I got it, I applied for the job and um, kept on playing in bands. And I remember it was a year, year later, I was playing in the pit orchestra on a Wednesday afternoon. I was playing bass and there was the cabaret, there was a singer, a singer, a comedian on, and I'm sitting there in the pit orchestra, and I think, I really don't want to be doing this. You know, yes, it's money, but, you know, playing playing in a pit orchestra at a summer season, you know, comedy show is not what I saw life was about. So at that point, I gave up playing professionally, devoted myself full time to the magazine work. Did you ever wear ear protectors? when you were in the band? No, but in those days, there was, there, you didn't have the excesses of loudness that you have routinely once they started miking everything. You had your backline amp and the singer went through the public address system, but that was it. So it was not the extremes of loudness that you routinely got once you started miking everything on the stage and putting it through a monster PA. Um, I have a slight loss of sensitivity in the presence region, which I think was due to that experience. But the audiologist said, oh, don't worry about it. It's still within the range. It's still within the normal range with a capital N, uppercase N. Um, <laughs> that was really the only legacy, I think. 